Black dads do matter and are in fact needed in our community to be the safest and healthiest and the most brilliant that it can be. Hello, I'm Pamela D. Marshall, the author of The Art of Forgiveness. You're watching the Timbuktu Report. I thank you for joining us. We're gonna be talking about the myths about black dads, African-American fathers. I have one with me tonight, Dr. Rick Stevenson, who is our guest every week on the Timbuktu Report. Dr. Stevenson, how are you? I am well, thank you. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you for asking. Thank you for being here with us. Good to be here. Good to be alive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Rick Stevenson is a professor of African-American studies and African-American history at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and he is also a man of the cloth. And we would not get this show started if we did not ask Dr. Stevenson, who is also a man of the cloth, to take us to the Lord in prayer. So Dr. Stevenson, if you would do that, please. Absolutely. God, we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to see another day. We're also grateful for this session tonight, the platform you've given us to talk about fathers, especially Black fathers, and to destroy some of the myths that have been promoted as early as the 1960s. So bless this time, we pray. We pray that people's ears may be opened, their hearts might be softened, and that the men who hear it, if they're not engaged with their children, that they might, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dr. Stevenson, <laughs> Dr. Stevenson, yes. you uh, grew up with a mom and a dad, a very yeah. strong presence of your father. Yeah. I too, um, the 11th of 13 children with the same mom and the same dad. Um, the the African-American dad um, that we don't always get a favorable press about this critical role in the African-American community and the African-American family. Dr. Stevenson, if you would just speak to what does that mean for all those watching, from the little children that are watching of all colors, of all genders, and I suppose just that right there could be a whole show that we could talk about. What does that do to the psyche? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, black fathers get a bad rap. Society has painted us with this broad brush of uh, absenteeism and inability or unwillingness to, to serve and to protect our kids. I, that wasn't my story. And a lot of the fathers, uh, that I engage with are also not in that in that framework. My father was uh, he was my hero. He's amazing. I'm the oldest of five, and I'm named after him. And he 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 revealed to us, and he demonstrated to us what it meant to not only be a father, but to to be a husband, to be a confidant, um, and a protector. And I think that there are young boys and young girls out here today who need just that. Um, I was reading this book one time. I can't think of the name of it. Um, it was called, oh, it was called Fatherhood, Rising to the Ultimate Challenge. And in the book, the author says that Woody Allen made this statement. Um, the most important thing you can do is show up. And that's pretty much it. Sometimes what children need uh, it's not just a lot of input. Sometimes they just want to see you. They just want to hear the bass in your voice. They, they, they need that, that presence. There's, there's something about um, mom telling me to go sit down that was a lot different than when daddy said, go sit down. <laughs> you know, there is a... a Dr. Stevenson, there yeah. was a lot different in my mother telling us to go do something and just hearing daddy's truck. <laughs> before he even got to the house. Right. Or or the threat. Just wait yeah. until your father gets home. Yeah. You couldn't even sleep, you know. So but 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 you're right. I think that um there is a sense in which uh the stereotypes have been so well oiled that it in a sense has become reality. But there are a number of different organizations 
um, that are out here. There's an organization called Belief in Fatherhood. Uh, uh, LeBron James is a part of it. Barack Obama is a part of it. Uh, Raphael Warnock is a part of it. And these are men who have come together to to reveal and to demonstrate what it means to be a father and why to be there. Jay-Z is a part of it. Um, it was started by a couple guys, a guy named Jimmy Allen, who was a country music star, and another guy named Glenn Henry. He's a kind of a YouTube, YouTube sensation. And they came together to kind of lay the foundation for uh, an upspring, if you will, of this against this argument that black fathers are not there. You know, one of the surprising things for me, uh, learning that per capita, there are more white men who are not in their children's lives Absolutely. than black men. Absolutely. The, but the, the portrayal, the betrayal, the portrayal of black men not being in their children's lives, how do we as a community, because even if the parents are not married, statistics show that black men are still more likely to be involved in their children's lives than other groups, including the, the Hispanic community as well as the white community, that black men are still more present in their children's lives than other communities. How do we start to dispel this myth that black dads don't matter and that they're not around? Yeah, I think that, um, well, first of all, we have to recognize that it's a myth that someone else controlled the narrative. And it's like anything else in America. Um, uh, whoever writes the books controls the narrative. Uh, so that's one aspect. I think another part of it is just becoming a part of, I used to be a member of an organization called the 100 Black Men of America. And um, I say used to be because my schedule just got so crazy. I just couldn't put the time in. But it's a great organization that has mentoring programs. And we understand that sometimes the only Black father that a person sees is a father figure. It is that person who stands in that role. And we have that quite frequently. Um, you mentioned uh, the numbers. Uh, the CDC did a study and they, just, and they found that 70% uh, black fathers uh, are engaged with their kids. Whereas, as you mentioned, the number of uh, white and uh, Hispanic um, fathers are not. Black fathers are 70% more likely to have bathed their children, who have dressed them, diapered them, um, uh, taken them to school. They do their homework with them. And even though black people as a, as a whole are a smaller number of the, of the other um, ethnic groups, we tend to be more engaged. But I think there's another part of it. And I think, and that part is we forget the role that slavery has played in the separation of fathers from their children and starting this concept that black men are not around. And I think that we have to acknowledge that, um, that black men, um, have always wanted to be with their kids. Oftentimes though, even when they wanted to, there were other dynamics that participated in keeping them separated. And sometimes it may have even been the mother who um, used the child as the pawn. Those kinds of things come up as well. So I think that we have to look at this, this situation and this portrayal, I like, the way, I like that word portrayal, um, from a larger um, uh, painting, if you will, just to see what's really going on here. When we look at Anne Davis, Louise McKinney, thank you so much for joining us, for watching. We do see the images in the movies and um, that don't necessarily represent what is reality mm -hmm. in the African-American community. Even though there have been these systems that, have, that were put in place, uh, as we've talked about in other shows, public housing that that's said, we'll give you somewhere to live, but you can't have a man. Exactly. You. And, and uh, many people don't even understand how that all came about when they see a lot of single women living in public housing. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you can get in public housing. Exactly, exactly. The only way you can get in public housing is to be a single woman without a man. And generally, you know, there, there are very few times that, and there are some cases where there's their husband and wives that are in uh, section eight. Mm -hmm. um, 
But that whole um, program that was designed, which is really bizarre to me when you think about uh, government funding and you want to strengthen the community, but you actually write the rules out that destroys the black family. Exactly. Redlining, for instance, um, when when during the Great Migration, you have this the significant number of African Americans leaving the South to come to come north for employment. Uh, also, they're fleeing lynching and the fear of just being able to walk down the street and not be killed. But when they get here, uh, there's there's no home for them. There there the 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 the, the homeowner the homeowners and the bank lenders and the salespersons direct black people to a certain segment of society, oftentimes segments uh, that are experiencing kind of environment, environmental injustice. Uh, and so, you know, it is important that we try to, to take into account um, that there are forces beyond our control that dictate that narrative. There's a, a documentary film producer named Tero Brooks, and he believes, he argues that the mainstream media is unwilling to show black men and black black fathers in a positive light. Uh, I remember uh, there's a book called The Color of Law, and the author talks about, his name is Rothstein, he talks about how even the projects, when they were first built, they weren't built for black people, they were built for white people. Uh, they were built for white soldiers who came back from the war, and they were called projects, not the not the the noun, the verb. It was a project. Was a Will project. this thing work? Yeah. Right. And uh, when you start getting this influx of black people, then um, they start building suburbs. Right. Remember, there was an urban environment and a rural environment. And then when you get this influx of blacks from the South, they create another environment called a suburban environment. We call the birds. We don't even realize that the reason we have suburbs is because they are suburban. They're moved out of the urban environment and they were created specifically for white people. And so those are also factors that kind of play into this, this, um, this separation of, of persons of the same um um, childbearing group. Yeah. Um, locally, you talked about some groups that have been working to build and keep uh, Black fathers together in relationships with their children and to help lift them up. Locally, Ryan Jones with his Be a Better Father program. But your church, your church is also doing something coming up yeah. for this Father's Day. Tell us about that. So uh, this actually started. No, don't, 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 don't tell us about it. I'll, I'll tell them about it. Good afternoon. Welcome to Spring Hill Missionary Baptist Church. We invite you to a Father's Day worship service, June 18th. We're going to have bikers and barbecue. Jesus with a donkey. We ride Harley. We come in on two. So bring your bikes, bring your trikes, anything with outdoors. We're going to fellowship. We're going to eat. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. God bless you and looking forward to seeing you on June 18th, 2023, right here at Spring Hill Missionary Baptist Church. How did that come about, Dr. Stevenson? So when I lived Louise in- says she loved it. I love it too. Who said that? Uh, one of our viewers. <laughs> Louise said, hey, look, y'all so go- I used to ride a motorcycle. You used to ride one? In Los Angeles. And I ran into these guys who didn't- You they still would always ride a motorcycle. What are you talking about? You used to I do. Yeah, I'm trying to set the story up. Okay, okay. Right, yeah. Uh, okay. And so I met these guys who asked me, well, why do you always come out here so late in the day? I said, well, I go to church in the morning. Why don't you come to church? He said, well, we don't, we don't have church clothes. So I said, well, you don't need us. And then I thought about it, right? In most, a lot of black churches, you got to have on a suit and tie. And so I started doing a Bible study for bikers. Wow. And then you could ride your bike to church. And then when I moved to Michigan, I would do a worship service in the parking lot of the church for bikers. 
And every year we bring the, we put, we do the whole thing outside. We have barbecue, we'd have bouncy houses for the kids. Uh, and we'd have man, 50, 60, 70 bikes in the parking lot. We do the whole worship service outside. So I talked to pastor Taylor about it and said, Hey man, um, what do you think about doing something like this? And he said, Hey, it sounds like a great idea. Go ahead and run with this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. So Father's Day this year, we're doing an outside worship service. People are coming on their motorcycles, and it's it's, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be outside, and hopefully we'll have good weather. But we just want to honor fathers, but also those who don't normally come to church, because you would be surprised how restrictive uh, some churches can be with the tire. And a lot of bikers, you know, if they're truly bikers, they don't wear nice shirts and ties. They ride, they wear leathers, they wear jeans. So that's how I got involved. And that's how we brought it here to uh, to Spring Hill. So have you done this before here in Gainesville? Or is this your Not first in Gainesville. Year? This is the first time in Gainesville. First time in Gainesville. This is our first time in Gainesville. This one in June is going to be our maiden voyage. And and it's a it's a, an opportunity mm-hmm. to bring together um so many, as you said, people who may not think that this is the place that would welcome me. Exactly. exactly. So, so how does that play a role in these men and who, you know, who may not be bikers, but may see that as, oh, gosh, they're accepting them. Maybe I can go, too. Exactly. I think that um, because because there is a there's a notion that bike culture is gang culture. And in a sense, it is. There are, you know, obviously bike gangs. But um, I think that if we pay close attention to the life of Jesus, he was very revolutionary in the way he did what he did. And I think that as we look at ministry nowadays, some ministries, uh, they're more status quo than revolutionary. And I think that um, there, I heard this statement one time, if... Um, uh, if Muhammad doesn't come to the mountain, we got to take the mountain to Muhammad. And the point is, if we're serious about doing ministry, then we have to understand that there are a lot of people out there who may even want to come to church, uh, who, who may or want to hang out with Christmas, but they can't because we have put up all these different barriers. So one of the things we're trying to do is one, outreach, but two, there are fathers at our church. I mean, there are fathers who may not go to church, who may come just because they can ride their motorcycle. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. you know, yeah. speaking speaking of the the church, the institution of church, which is another place where there are majority women. Yep. What is it that the men of congregations, the men of faith, what do you think needs to happen to help change that look in bringing more men into the the space of spirituality that's a that's a great question and that was one of the things that i wrestled with and helped and a friend of mine uh bishop keith reed helped me to overcome that and that was one i used to do this bible study called the mail call uh on saturday mornings and specifically for men and it was a safe space and we didn't only we didn't always do it in the church. Sometimes we would take over a restaurant. Sometimes we'd go to the park. Sometimes we would just, you know, sit out in the parking lot. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I, I encourage the women whose husbands or men friends didn't come to church not to go home and talk about what Pastor did Sunday. Oh man, Pastor preached this sermon because because that's competition, and sometimes. Some of these young brothers, uh, they see the pastor as a threat as opposed to someone um, who they can sit down and talk with. Uh, I used to go hunting with the members of with the men in my church, you know, those kind of things. So uh, discipleship has to be multi-level. It can't be just what happens on Sundays. You got to have it's got to be multidimensional. And so I tried to tap in to the other areas and the, and and the numbers of men in our in our church began to grow significantly. We're talking oh, tonight. One more, one more thing. What? I also did a Bible study in a barbershop. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. Uh, it was a barbershop where the guys used to know smoke weed, smoke cocaine, sell drugs, whole nine yards. And they didn't believe I was a preacher because every time they saw me, I had on something. I, I was in a suit, sometimes on the bike. And um, the guy, the owner said, listen, man, what do you do for a living? So I said, I'm a pastor. He said, you can't be no pastor. You got earrings. You got dreadlocks. Come on. So I said, if I'm really a pastor, you cut my hair for a month for free. He said, okay. So I gave him one of my business cards. And he can't, <laughs> he can't hurt me preach. I ended up baptizing his daughters. And we, we, we've been best friends now for like 19 years. So my point is that sometimes the pastor is seen as a threat to some of these men. And we have to allow them to see our vulnerabilities and some of the areas that uh, we really enjoy having fun at and say it's okay to do that stuff. We're talking about the myth about black myths about black fathers and them not being involved in their children's lives. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, there are some other statistics that would help uh, bear support to that. The disproportionate number of black men that are incarcerated in America. Um, you talked about Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. Mm-hmm. Talk about how the law, um, we, we spoke about public housing and, and how the law says that there can't be a man there in the mm-hmm. home in order for you to get assistance. But talk about the laws that impact black men being the fathers, the husbands that they could be because they're incarcerated. Absolutely. Um, Real quick, um, the mandatory sentencing laws that were passed uh, in the 19, uh, late 70s, early 80s and 90s, where a young black kid, 17 or 18 years old, might get caught with a five dollar vial vial of crack cocaine and the mandatory sentence was 25 years you get a white kid that gets caught with a pound of cocaine cocaine he might get probation um the fact that some young black children are adulterified uh there was just a shooting uh a, a white man killed a young uh 14 year old kid because he thought he was too big and the kid's only 14 years old, weighed 104 pounds. So, so this notion that black children look older than they are, therefore should be tried as adults. You look at the, um, the uh, now uh, infamous um, Central Park Five, Central Park Six, Five. Um, they were tried as adults. They were sent to prison as adults. One, for something they did not commit. So, and that's a whole different story. That's why the Exodus program is so important to look at how many young black men have been uh, uh, killed or sent to prison uh, for a crime they did not commit because they couldn't afford an attorney. I mean, so there, there are so many factors that have to go and have, we had to take into account when we look at the, the fact that absenteeism is not just because the father doesn't want to be there, but there are systems in place that are designed to make sure that we're not there because it it does weaken the black community. And, and don't get me wrong. There are a lot of strong mothers who've done some great job with as single parents, but, but there is something different when daddy comes home. You know, my son, I'm a, my oldest son is 47. My youngest son will be 30 in June. And we still talk two, three times a week. We FaceTime, we text. I send them texts almost every other morning. So there is a there is something about the connection that fathers have with their sons and daughters that's just different. And I think God designed it that way. Well, you know, Dr. Stevenson, as you're talking about all of these things, and uh, since COVID, we have heard the words about what science has, supports um, more probably than in, in recent times. Well, here, here's another study that was done, empirical data that shows that when a father is active in his children's lives, his kids are likely to be more engaged in school mm-hmm. and have healthy brain function. So knowing that that has been documented, Yet all of these things continue to happen that separate or create a culture that separates dads from their children. And in particularly 
black fathers from their children. You know, that study alone is something that needs to be preached from the pulpit. I agree. One hundred percent. Um uh the census report showed that seventy five percent of white men, eighty percent of black men, eighty one percent of Asian men, eighty three percent of Hispanic men uh have kids between the ages of forty and forty nine. And yet the numbers of relationships in those percentages are higher in the black community than they are in any other community. Now, what does that say? I think one of the things that we fail to realize, and I talk a little bit about this in one of my courses, is um, Black people come from a tribal community kind of environment. We've always been tribal. That's how come we have, you, you may have lived in a neighborhood, I don't know whether you did or not, where you had more than one aunt. That wasn't really your aunt mm-hmm. or more than one uncle. That that extended family concept has always been a part of who we are, and it was it was it had to increase during slavery because our kids and family were being separated so frequently. So we've always understood the importance of taking taking a role in raising that child. That's part of who we have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 the dominant culture has noticed that they recognize that when they sold Tommy off the plantation. Um, when he got some to another plantation, somebody took him in. That's yeah. who we are. Mm-hmm. We are that family. I had, you know, Aunt June across the street and, you know, Uncle Thomas down the road. They weren't blood. They were extended family. So it is in our ethos to want to be connected uh, to family. And when, when, when the dominant culture recognizes how easily we do that, even in slave ships, it's fun. It's funny. I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing an article now, well, it's part of a chapter, but I'm writing this, this document and I'm looking at different ethnic groups that were warring on land, but once they got on the slave ships, they figured out how to build community. Wow. Because they had a common enemy, the mm-hmm. slave ship owners. You follow me? And mm-hmm. so it's not uncommon, even if they didn't speak a different, the same language, they figured out how to create pidgin languages so they could commune. So it's not un, it's not uncommon for us to have this desire to connect familiarly. The myth about Black fathers and their lack of involvement in their families, lives, and in the community is just that. It is a myth. And it's amazing how powerful the propaganda is, Mm -hmm. because as you and I sit here, grew up with one mom, one dad. So statistically, we don't match. Yet the narratives in the propaganda would say otherwise. There are those who might tune in who might automatically assume that we grew up with a single mom Mm -hmm. because that's what the narrative has been. So I want to. Thank you again for being a part of the Timbuktu Report and for all of those who watch this show on a regular basis and share it. I, I, I think that it is so critical for us to continue to tell our stories and to tell the truth about who we are rather than just passively accepting the narratives. I mean, we, we can, you can have a group, you can have a couple's night and it's all husbands and wives of black folks. Mm-hmm. And yet all those black people can sit and see a story on television about deadbeat dads. And if you're not careful, them Negroes will chime in. Because <laughs> we've been so programmed. Conditioned. <laughs> we've been so conditioned. <laughs> you can have 15 couples of black folks. Right. And a new story will come on and them jokers will start, yeah, girl, you know, I so and so. Shut up. We have to be lifting each other up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, uh, you're right. That I don't think people realize how the Moynihan Report from 1965, you know, has sunk its, its fangs into the community. And into our lives, there was um, the, the report was called the Negro Family: The Case of a National Action. And the report claimed that the increased rates of out of wedlock births and single mothers in the African American community would would signal the destruction to the black family. That's what the argument said, right? Uh, but it wasn't really based on serious data. And but 
because you know you have news outlets that constantly share this narrative and they're yeah. constantly building upon it and then there's no pushback you know we begin to assume well maybe that's true maybe it's true <laughs> you know. louise louise says now louise this is actually a whole nother show uh, she said so true when my husband is having a meeting with my son i've learned to let him lead and not interfere at the wrong time while my husband is disciplining him still working on that this is yeah. a myth yeah. yeah yeah um and down in the other i think that's what she was she was trying to say mm -hmm. but that's another challenge for black women in stepping back and letting daddy be daddy because sometimes mm -hmm the moms can come in and do some castration with just a look. Yeah. Be, and, and yet, you know, the daddy is trying to fulfill his role as the protector mm -hmm. because he recognizes what his sons, his daughters are going to face outside those doors. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I think also for us as women, uh, Davis, Louise, McKinney, I think for us as Black women, understanding how to help lift our men up as opposed to being part of the challenge. Yeah, I think that is that is so very important. I think that, um, you know, it's funny how conversations come up. One of the things my wife had, my wife has had some business to take care of, so she's gone for a couple of days. And when she re when she returned, I was sharing with her how peaceful my life is because she's in it, and I, I think that that black men have so much. Not that black women don't, but there is so much stress that we experience outside the walls of the home that when we're in the household, there is nothing. I think there are very few things more sacred than the stressless presence of your significant other and you feel about them as they feel about you. Oh, absolutely. Ooh, B.B. King did the song Caledonia. I'm not familiar with that. Caledonia? Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, Caledonia, what make your big head so hard? <laughs> <laughs> what B.B. King said. We're talking about that relationship. So is Caledonia a place or a woman? A woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it takes all of us. Called Caledonia. Hmm? There's a city in Michigan called Caledonia. Oh, really? Yeah. BB King has a song about that too. Yeah. But look at that when we get off air. Please do. It, it's on YouTube. Speaking of speaking of looking up. Before we leave, I want to play your commercial again because okay. Father's Day weekend is going to be very special at your church. You guys are inviting men of all modes of transportation to come out and be a part yeah. of, of the Father's Day service at your church. Here we go. He Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Spring Hill Missionary Baptist Church. We invite you to a Father's Day worship service, June 18th. We're going to have bikers and barbecue. Jesus with a donkey. We ride Harley. We come in on two. So bring your bikes, bring your trikes, anything without doors. We're going to fellowship. We're going to eat. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. God bless you and looking forward to seeing you on June 18th, 2023, right here at Spring Hill Missionary Baptist Church. No, it's not just for fathers either. Um, if you if you're a woman and you have a bike, or you're a, a woman, female bike club, come on down. Just bring the bikes. Bring the bikes. Bring the bikes. Bring the, the bikes. bikes and the bring trikes. The bikes. <laughs> the bikes and the trikes. And even if you don't have a bike, you're still welcome to come. That's right. Whatever. If, if you have a slingshot, you ever seen a slingshot? No. This oh yeah. Park, I think don't have doors. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that. I didn't know that's what it was yeah, called. Yeah, whatever. Just bring it. Just come. We're gonna have some fun. It's gonna be yeah, great. That sounds like a great I'm, time. I'm thinking about um, like when when I was when I was in Michigan, we would do uh, certificates like uh, or trophies for the loudest pipes. Oh, or, good gracious! A like, group that brought the most people. Um, yeah, we'd have it was just a blast, man. It's just fun on bikes. So, 
and and I'm preaching. Oh wow, we need yeah, to make sure that we're, that that we're, we're, we're there for that. Our men are needed in their child's life to teach them, help educate them, to support them in this cycle of life in this university of life. Hey, Louise, did you get your book? And I hope you're reading it, Dr. Stevenson. Did you get your book? Every time I think about it, I forget. Every time I, here we go. The Art of Forgiveness, an expression of peace. It makes a great Mother's Day gift as well. As a matter of fact, look, take a look at this, Dr. Stevenson. Did you edit that? I did not edit it. Oh. I did. Yeah, I had somebody else to do it. I helped to direct it, but I did not edit it. That's pretty cool. You like it? Well, you can tell he's making all the money out here. You got the big bucks. Look, cattle on a thousand hills <laughs> belongs to my daddy. There's a herd up there with my name on it. And whenever Good. I need to take one to the slaughterhouse, I there need some money. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Stevenson, again, thank you very much for you. being with us. And everybody watching, I really appreciate you all watching and having these discussions. Hey, Pastor Vivian Green, Pastor Green, I don't know if you saw the commercial or not, Dr. Stevenson and his group are having uh, a motorcycle Father's Day event. Thank you for sharing your story. Forgiveness is key. Uh, Pastor Green, I'm looking forward to coming to Georgia. Uh, to be with you all there at some point, please let me know. Love it. Enjoying reading this book. It needs to be on the bestseller list. Oh my goodness. Mm, that's great. Thank you so much. That is so sweet. So kind. I appreciate that. So Dr. Stevenson, again, I thank you. Mm. I am looking forward to being with you all on Father's Day. And as Mother's Day comes up and, and Pastor Green says, sound great, Dr. Stevenson. Thank you. You gonna ride your motorcycle? Me? Yes. Dr. Stevenson. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Then bring your bike. I've been on a motorcycle probably twice in my life. Oh, and awesome. yeah. And it was in a parking lot, a park and then a parking lot. So that's the extent for me. Okay. But you know, I I uh applaud all of you who can do that and do it well, but that does not keep us from coming to this, this right. event to yeah. honor the men of our community, the men in our lives, as well as those who have laid a foundation for us to be here. So thank you. That's going to be at Spring Hill on Father's Day. But before that, Mother's Day is coming up. So we're going to do a show talking about this very important role of women. Absolutely. And Pastor Green, you can be on the show with us. Why don't we talk about that? Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? Because there wouldn't be no fathers without no mothers. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're arguing it theologically, but we're not going to do that right now. But. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. My pleasure. Um, do you have one of your clothing line? Oh, yeah, I do. This is one of my dresses. She asked if I had on something for my clothing line. I'm going to oh. stand up. Judo. Okay. It's one of them. I'm excited about that. I'm really excited about that. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us for this edition of the Timbuktu Report. We will be back here next Thursday on Monday. Sisters of Wellness, we hope that you will join us for that too. I'm Pamela Marshall, and you can get that, um, Louise. You can get one address. Uh, I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. Remember, there is healing at the well. Make it a fantastic moment. We will see you next time.